Okay, so next is uh, Laura from uh, Laura Klassen, who's uh, coming to us from BNL, where I think she just started there this year, so correct me if I'm wrong. So somehow I think moved either just pre-quarantine or during the quarantine. Uh, but in any case, uh, let's welcome uh, Laura. Same thing, Laura, I'll give you a five minute warning uh, towards the end of your talk. All right, thank you. Uh, can you hear me and yes. see the slides? Yeah, yes. I actually moved uh, just before the quarantine, just in time. <laughs> much. Um, yeah, and thank you to the organizers for this wonderful mini-conference and uh, for the opportunity to present our results here. My talk is going to be about Van Hoff physics and twisted bilayer graphene. And oh, I want to start with also thanking my collaborators on this topic, and in particular, Dimitri Shishinatze, who is a graduate student at the University of Minnesota and who should really get all the credit for almost all the results I'm going to present. Uh, you can find these results in these two publications on the archive. And yeah, it, as before, I don't think I have to really introduce twisted bilayer graphene. Just to set the stage, I want to, I'm hearing myself. But, just to set the stage, I want to say a few words and maybe emphasize some aspects that we didn't discuss before. So, Laura, just a second. I don't know if the KTB staff, can you just ensure that everybody's muted? Is that possible? Can you mute all? Because there is some feedback there. I reduced my um, volume. Maybe okay. that helped. I think it it's better. fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, sir. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so we have this twist induced in potential, which leads around the magic angle to isolated flat bands separated from the higher energy bands. However, these flat bands retain some dispersion with interesting features as Dirac points around charge neutrality and Van Hoff points at higher energies. And these Van Hoff points lead to peaks in the density of states, which are also prominent features in scanning tunneling spectroscopy. And here you see two examples. Um, and then, of course, there is the evidence for insulating and superconducting behavior near integer fittings of these flat bands. And even if the resistive feature at integer fittings seems rather weak, there's evidence, as we just heard, for competing orders. Um, between a nematic superconductor and an anisotropic normal state, which presumably have different origin for the nematicity. And then what's very interesting um, to us is that these correlated phases seem to appear near Van Hoff singularities in the density of states. So for example, um, we see a gap opening in the peak when the Van Hoff singularity crosses the Fermi level around half fitting of conduction or valence bands. And more recent measurements of the Hall density are also consistent even with multiple Van Hoff singularities. And again, we see a gap opening around fitting factors of plus minus two, um, where the Hall density is re reset to zero. Theoretically, it's been discussed that the Van Hoff singularities can be pinned to the Fermi level um, at integer fittings because of band reconstructions from the interactions. And if you stare long enough at these, the IDV curves, you might convince yourself that you can see this. So we've taken all this evidence as a motivation to study what type of correlated phases you can get because of the presence of these Van Hoff singularities. And this is what I want to um, go through in the remainder of this talk. Now, um, to be more specific here, I'll consider what was yesterday at some point called normal twisted bilayer graphene. Um, and as I already did, I'm interpreting these peaks in the density of states as Van Hoff singularities. And this is maybe somewhat in contrast to a strong coupling point of view where you would have to interpret them as split flat bands with a gap in between, which I think is difficult to reconcile with some of the measurements I showed on the previous slide. And then I'm going to focus on the Van Hoff singularities, the primary ones, 
in the vicinity of this filling of plus minus two. And the remainder of the talk will then go as follows. First, I want to show how these Van Hove points appear in theoretical models of twisted bilayer graphene. And this I'll use as an input to introduce simpler effective models that we have used to study these correlated phases from Van Hove physics. And our goal here was to first determine all possible attractive correlated states that we get from this scenario. And I show how this can lead to pneumatic superconductivity in the ground state. And I'm also gonna discuss the possible attractive charge and spin orders and again, a pneumatic normal state. Okay, at first um, I want to emphasize that these Van Hove points must be there independent of the model that you pick to describe the band structure for twisted bilayer graphene, if it's continuum or tight binding. The reason is that there are Dirac points at um, charge neutrality and then a closed Fermi surface at larger filling. So in between there must be a Lifshitz transition from open to closed Fermi surface, which is connected to the appearance of the Van Hove points. The only thing that is dependent on the model is the number of these Van Hove points. And in twisted bilayer graphene, for this hexagonal symmetry, there are two possibilities. We can either have three or six Van Hove points per valley, which would translate to six or 12 in total for both valleys. And because we don't know the exact microscopic model, we consider both cases. And I also wanna go through examples for both cases now. So let's start with the um, three Van Hove points per valley. And here you see a band structure along high symmetry lines taken from this faithful six band model of this publication for the first valley and then also the corresponding, corresponding color plot in the Brion zone. And what I'm gonna do now is move the Fermi level through the valence band and you'll see the corresponding Fermi surfaces appear here. And I'm, I'm gonna slightly increase the magnitude of the Fermi level. So we'll start then with Fermi pockets around K and K prime points, which grow and then at the Lifshitz transition they touch and here you see the three promised Van Hove points. And if I increase the Fermi level further or, or in that case lower it further, uh, the Fermi surface is split again and I get this closed Fermi surface around the gamma point. And now I can change the parameters of this model somewhat. And you see that um, because of that, I get now six Van Hove points. So I'm gonna do the same, move the Fermi level through the valence band. And we get again these pockets around K and K prime points. But this time in contrast to before, additional pockets appear along, the, uh, along three of the gamma M lines. And these pockets now touch with the ones around K and K prime points, which in this case leads to six Van Hove points. And then afterwards they detach and form the closed firm surface around the gamma point. So in summary, we can have these two cases, as I said, either three or six Van Hove points per valley in the first valley. And note that now I've changed the model to plot these Fermi surfaces and Van Hove points to one that is based on Vanier states. But the um, characteristic features stay the same in that case. Then I'm gonna add the second valley and this doubles the number of the Van Hove points in both cases. So in total, we have either six Van Hove points in the Brion zone or 12. And as I said, because we don't know the microscopic model, we consider both cases of the following. Now, why are these points so interesting? The reason is that they amplify interaction effects. And we can see this if we look at the dimensionless interaction, which is the interaction times the density of states. And in 2D away from Van Hove points, this would just give us the ratio of interaction over bandwidth because the density of states is a constant and inversely proportional to the bandwidth. However, at the Van Hove points, the density of states diverges 
as signaled by these peaks in the um, tunneling spectra. So this means that also the dimensionless interaction grows really, really large. And uh, this is normally described by a logarithmic divergence. But in twisted bilayer there is the special case, very interesting special case between exactly six and 12 Van Hoff points, where the dispersion around the Van Hoff points becomes extraordinarily flat, which also has been discussed as an alternative magic condition even. And this leads to a stronger divergence, divergence in the form of a power law. And this again can induce very interesting new types of states. For example, if you have just one of these higher order Van Hoff points, your ground state can be a super metal. And if you have several of them, there's a new type of competing orders. However, before going into the competition of these orders, let's first determine what are the possible competitors. So which um, correlated phases can we get from these amplified interactions? And here I want to take an effective viewpoint. So I want to write down an effective model with input from the experiments. And if I do that, I can take the distance between the Van Hoff points as, a, an, as an estimate for the bandwidth, which would mean the bandwidth is at least 20 milli electron volt, probably more if the chemical potential is really inside the flat bands. And then we know that um, gap scales and critical temperatures are of the order of a few Kelvin, which translates to at most one milli electron volt. So in this um, point of view, I can describe the correlated phases as instabilities of the Fermi surfaces. And if this is the case, the leading behavior will come from states around the Van Hoff points simply because all states, almost all states, live around the Van Hoff points because that's where the density of states diverges. So in a simpler model, we can restrict ourselves to patches or states that live in patches around the Van Hoff points and forget the rest because the Van Hoff points will lead and the rest will just follow. And if you do this, we can then add interactions by simply writing down everything that's possible. So everything that's allowed by symmetry. If you do this, you get six different couplings for the six patch model with six one half points in the Brion zone and 18 principally allowed couplings in the case for the 12 patch model. And in both cases, uh, we neglect valley mixing. Otherwise you have a higher number of possible coupling, but this is um, supposed to be small interested by diagraphy. And with valley mixing, I mean that an electron is scattered from one valley to the other. Here, the colors represent the different valleys. This doesn't exclude processes like this, density-density type interactions between the two valleys or exchange interactions where the electrons remain in the valleys. And as I said before, so far, this is an effective model that is independent of your microscopic description, the only ingredient is that you have that these Van Hoff points are present. But of course, if we then want to determine um, the interactions for the in the different ordering channels and a hierarchy of the orders of the different orders, we need numbers for these couplings. So to get these bare values of the couplings, we take a microscopic model and project it onto the patches, which of course includes then induces a model dependence. We decided to go with the model by Kang and Waffek based on Van G states. And then the resulting interactions are non-local and the Hamiltonian is of this general form, Q plus alpha T, T squared, where the Q squared term gives you different density density interactions within a honeycomb plaquette. And this T term or T squared term gives you exchange like couplings or assisted hopping terms, again within a honeycomb plaquette. And the relative strength is given by this parameter alpha T, which will keep as an open parameter in the following because we don't know the exact microscopics. So keep in mind alpha T 
is the strength for the relative the relative strength for exchange like couples then to um, study or analyze the different interaction induced phases we introduced test vertices for all possibilities superconducting spin and charge orders the superconducting order of course pairs electrons with opposite momenta which also translates to a pairing of electrons from opposite patches and opposite valleys and the spin and charge orders are electron hole pairs which can be intra or interpatch depending on their wave vector now for zero wave vector we usually associate that with ferromagnetism um, but as we already heard yesterday because we have this valley degree of freedom we can get a general type of uh, valley magnetism and then this would also include different Pomeranchuk type orders and the possibility of pneumatic order because we have several of these Van Hoff points. Furthermore, the wave vector can be finite and connect the different patches, which would lead to charge or spin density waves and if imaginary to a current order. And we'll account for all of these different possibilities. Of course, there are more um, momentum transfers possible in the 12 patch model than in the six patch one. Um, and then we calculate the renormalization of these test vertices by summing different letter series in for all these in the different ordering channels. This leads to dressed vertices, a, a Dyson type equation for the dressed vertex from which we extract the eigenvalues. And from these eigenvalues, we can determine which channel becomes attractive and how strong the attraction is. And yeah, this is the process, and now I want to jump to our results. First, I'll discuss superconductivity and then the charge and spin orders. So, of course, we can classify the superconducting um, solutions based on their symmetry. In our case, the model has D3 symmetry, which has three irreducible representations, A1, A2, and E. And if you prefer for singlet superconductivity, we can roughly identify them with S-wave, I-wave, and D-wave. And as we heard in the previous talk, this D-wave is doubly degenerate because the E representation is two-dimensional. So there are, in fact, two degenerate solutions with D-wave symmetry. In our sign convention, if the eigenvalue becomes positive, this means the corresponding channel becomes attractive. And here you see the eigenvalues for the different pairing symmetries as function of this alpha T, which was the strength of the exchange like couples. And you see that for both six and 12 patch models, um, at least one eigenvalue becomes positive for large enough alpha T. So we get superconductivity at the bare level without a Kohn-Luttinger mechanism or anything. And the reason is, that um, the non-locality of these couplings, of in particular the exchange-like couplings. In the case with six Van Hoff points, uh, the attraction is in the D-wave channel. And in the case with 12 Van Hoff points, we get two attractive solutions, which are D-wave or I-wave-like. And um, in particular, this situation is very interesting because this is what will lead to the pneumatic superconducting ground state, as I want to discuss here. So, as I said, let's focus on these two superconducting solutions. Then the total superconducting gap will be um, of this form, a sum of three terms, two from the D-wave part. As I said, they are degenerate, so we have two solutions. Think of the x, y, and x squared minus y squared and then the I-wave part. And the ground state configuration of this superconducting gap will be determined by higher order terms in the free energy. So we have to look at least at the quartic terms. And the free energy has uh, two, or can roughly be uh, distinguished in two terms. One are, um, un sorry, conventional terms, 
made of bilinears of these superconducting gap functions. And then we have this important unconventional term, proportional to delta, which is cubic in the D wave gap and linear in the I wave one. And because of this term, the ground state will be a phase of coexistence that breaks the threefold lattice rotation symmetry. So because of this delta term, we get an emetic superconductor. More specifically, there are two possibilities. The coexistence phase can either break threefold lattice rotation symmetry and time reversal, time reversal symmetry, or if this delta is um, large enough, it can break only the threefold rotation symmetry and leave time reversal intact. We can see this, uh, that this is an emetic superconductor, for example, if you look at the resulting superconducting gap, which I've plotted here for three different values of this alpha t, along a circle in the Brion zone. And you see in all three cases that there is a two-fold symmetry instead of a three-fold one. So the gap is different at points that are related by three-fold symmetry, which means we have an emetic superconductor. And although this was for the 12th patch model, so 12 one half points in the Brion zone, we can get a similar scenario in the 6th patch model because we know if we move slightly away from one half fillings and um, allow for triplet superconductivity, F wave also becomes a competitor to D wave. So we again have these two superconducting solutions with the symmetries of the A2 and E irreducible representation. All right, next I want to go to the charge and spin orders. Um, here you see a graphic representation of these different uh, Dyson equations for the dressed vertices. And as I said, we test for uh, all possible orders, charge and spin pomeranz shook orders and charge and spin density waves. Um, and they all lead to this Dyson equations from which we extract the eigenvalues. And then the largest eigenvalue will also correspond to the largest attractive interaction in the corresponding ordering channel. We have seen that there are many possibilities, but if we focused on the two leading solutions, the picture is relatively simpler because in both cases with six and 12 one half points, the leading solutions are either a mixed charge and spin density wave or an S-wave spin Pomeranzschuk order. And here S-wave spin Pomeranzschuk order means this generalized uh, type of ferromagnetism within a valley. I discussed that in the next slide. Um, the spin Pomeranzschuk order always wins for any value of alpha t in the 12 patch model and for large enough alpha t in the six patch model. Here for smaller values of alpha t, we get the mixed charge and spin density wave. So as I said, this S-wave spin Pomeranzschuk order really corresponds to a ferromagnetic moment within a valley, uh, which means without valley mixing, the two moments can have any orientation, the two moments in the two valleys. And we need a coupling between both valleys to fix their orientation. A natural possibility is, in our case, are the fluctuations of the nearby density wave order. So that's what we did. We've coupled the spin Pomeranzschuk order to fluctuations of these density waves and then integrated out the density waves, which leads to an effective coupling between both valleys which favors an antiferromagnetic alignment. So in summary, we get a valley antiferromagnet out of this procedure. And this is the same as uh, what was found for a strong coupling analysis of this interaction Hamiltonian around half filling. But of course, there are other possibilities depending on what is the dominant intervalley coupling. In particular, we could also have the, the scenario that one of the moments orders while the other remains disordered. So in that case, we would get a, a, a real valley ferromagnet. Then next, um, 
I said that for smaller values of alpha t, we have this mixed charge and spin density wave order in the six patch model. The corresponding wave vector has magnitude qs, and there are three inequivalent possible um, wave vectors in the six patch model for with magnitude qs. Without valley mixing, the charge and spin density wave channels are degenerate, so they appear simultaneously. And because of the valley degree of freedom, the order parameters are complex in general, uh, which is different to single layer graphene where they would be either purely real or purely imaginary. And because of this, uh, these three possibilities, there are three order parameters for each of the density waves. And then again to- So, so Laura, just to let you know, you have five minutes for me. Thank you. I'm almost done. Um, so to determine the ground state configuration of this density wave, mixed density wave channel, we've again analyzed the free energy and we found that the spin moments prefer this 120 degree spin arrangement and that the relative phase between charge and spin sectors is pi half, so this I here. And this is very interesting because it means independent on what happens in charge and spin channel, overall there will always be a real part and an imaginary part. And um, that in turn means in real space we have a real density wave, but the imaginary part would lead to a current loop order, which bears the potential of an interaction induced topological phase, which is something we have to look at in more detail in the future. And then finally, I want to mention this last possibility of a nematic anisotropic phase, because we've also looked at uh, subleading channels, which are still attractive, again, because we don't know the microscopic model. So renormalizations or another model could change the order, um, the hierarchy of these attractions. So, um, and we found that the D-wave Pomerantiuk order is also attractive. And this is again an order with zero wave vector transfer, which has a D wave form factor now in momentum space instead of an S wave one. And similar to the superconductivity, this can only become attractive because of the non-locality of the interactions. We find again that both spin and charge order are attractive, but the reason why this becomes a nematic state is really due to the charge order because for this one, we get cubic terms in the free energy, which also couple to the spin part. And that means that in the ground state, one out of three equivalent minima will be picked. And this translates in real space to a bond order that picks one out of three symmetry directions, which leads to the nematic uh, or anisotropic normal state. Okay, um, this brings me then to the summary. I've shown you that there's evidence for Van Hoff singularities appearing near the correlated phases in twisted bilayer graphene, which is why we've analyzed what possible correlated phases you can get from effective models uh, that include these Van Hoff points uh, with the two possibilities of either six or 12 Van Hoff points in the Brion zone. We found that because of the non-local interactions in twisted bilayer graphene, we can get correlated phases at the bare level, meaning that even superconductivity or this D-wave Pomerantiuk channel can be attractive at the bare level. And then we've combined the results with a free energy analysis, which showed that there is nematic superconductivity in the ground state from the coupling of two superconducting solutions. And then I've uh, shown the possible charge and spin orders that become attractive. Uh, there is a ferromagnet within a valley. We've discussed a mixed density wave and current order, and there's the possibility of a nematic normal state. Um, in the future, we want to look at the interplay of these orders, because so far we've looked at them separately to first determine what becomes a possible player. But of course, it will be interesting to look at the interplay of superconductivity with, with these charge or spin orders 
And for example, the Valley Antiferro Magnet is a very interesting candidate here because it is not pair breaking. So this could be a potential candidate for a high temperature um, phase out of which superconductivity develops. And then of course, it will be interesting to go into the ordered states and look how they reconstruct the bands, the, what is the corresponding gap structure, um, and maybe the possibility of secondary Van Hoek points. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, Laura, for a great talk. Um, so we have a good amount of time for questions. I think what I'm gonna do is start with the text questions and I'll give you permission to ask your question yourself, and if you don't, then I'll just ask it. So the first was from uh, Arup Paul. So I need to, sorry, this is a little bit clunky. So Arup Paul, uh, I've given you permission to talk, so if you wanna unmute yourself, um, otherwise I'll ask the question. Yeah, so my question is from the patch model. So I was wondering how would, what would be the effect of uh, like interlayer electric field and also like perpendicular magnetic field on the coupling within the patches? Um, okay, so a perpendicular magnetic field would, so first of all, we would get a Zeeman splitting, I guess. So we get different types of couplings. If that is not too big, I, I would assume that our analysis remains valid. And then we would have to look at how the ordered phases react to the magnetic field. So um, in the case, for example, of this, let me go to the slide. Um, in the case of this valley antiferro magnet, uh, of course, that would at some point flip one of the states to, um, to get a ferromagnetic arrangement. Uh, yeah, the others, I'm not sure if there's an effect on the nematic order. And, oh, yeah, is that, does that answer the question or? Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Okay. So this is definitely something that is interesting to do in the future to work out the phenomenology of all these possible orders. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next question from Una, our panelist. Yes, uh, uh, my question was whether this uh, this Van Hoof, um starting point, the patch model, you are picking just a few points. That's you know you're picking the patches that's organizing everything. So I would think pneumatic that's you know getting juice from Van Hoof physics will somehow have to know about the lattice direction, like. Would have to be pinned to the lattice direction. Um, okay, so what I didn't say here, what we assumed, um, this D wave form factor is so we from what we can extract from the patch models is the symmetry, and we find that this D wave channel becomes attractive, and then you can assume that even if you go away from the patches and include the other states, the symmetry will probably stay the same of this order. So let's look at a uh, D wave order in the entire Brion zone. And if you, this D wave form factor then translates to a variation of the hoppings in real space. And right. this hopping variation is something like a bond order. So yes, right. So it will be a bond order that's yeah. specific to the bond. So I'm referring to like because of Yuan's talk that we saw earlier, where the pneumatic uh, easy axis seem to be uh, uncaring about the lattice direction. That's you know. So I, I'm asking question in that context. Experimentally. Yeah. So this is. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Just experimentally, it didn't seem to care about the the the. the the bond direction, and I would I would have imagined that this uh, mechanism would have to care about the bond direction. Yeah, so the, I would say this is something technical now because um, indeed there is this general possible um, angle that you saw in the previous talk. If you look at the free energy, uh, sorry. Um, so you can what we saw earlier these two D wave components you are 
also in this free energy with the general angle, but the minimum will appear at a certain point which favors one of the um, that is correct. I can interfere for one just one second. Uh, Una, um, I guess uh, when you're pointing this 12 page model, location of pages are not related to symmetry directions. As a result, okay. you ask about pneumatic superconducting order. That okay. is not related yeah. to any symmetry direction simply because location of Van Hoff points are outside any symmetry direction. Sorry, I'm saying. Yeah, that's right. Of course, I forgot that. Let me show the patches again. Uh, these these patches are, of course, not along symmetry directions. So. Okay, let me, let me move to the next question. But they're you know, close, right? They're close to the. Yeah. Let, let, let me move to the next question because there's, there's a few that are waiting, I think. Yeah? Uh, so the next question yeah. was uh, from Luke Rademacher, who asked me to read this question. Uh, you mentioned interaction induced topological phases that is similar to the idea from uh, the Burn of Vigyaz Danny paper. Uh, is that similar to the idea from the Burn of Vigyaz Danny paper about spontaneous Haldane mass cap? Um, so I'm not exactly sure which paper you're referring to. Um, there's a, there's I, an archive I, link in the chat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is definitely not the same as was discussed. So this is a many-body effect. So uh, you don't get this because you start with a topological single particle band um, from out of which the order develops. But this is uh, really a many-body topological phase. And I was thinking here um, about the paper by Lin and Nankishore, who showed that at least if these patches are at the zone boundary, you get a churn insulator. Okay, so yeah, I guess that's that's the, the indeed an answer to my question because it is about an interaction induced spontaneous churn insulator that they talk about. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. maybe I can ask you later if you have time to read that paper because it's an interesting idea. Uh, okay, so next question from Shenke Zhu. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Is, is that close? Thank you, Zuri, there. Oh, I'm going to allow you to talk. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. I didn't allow you to talk. Now you can. Okay. Right. So, uh, so uh, from your calculation, is there a clear uh, strong, strongest competing order of the superconductor? Um, um, so we didn't look at the competition yet, but just summed the different letter series. So there's, there's this effect is not included. And then on that level, you can compare the numbers basically um, of these eigenvalues, which would give you the attractive interaction in the channels. And then you see, of course, because the superconductor first has to turn attractive, it starts repulsive from the repulsive interaction. Uh, these numbers here are a lot smaller than the ones um, from the insulators. Well, well, a lot, you see that it's like something smaller than one compared to three maybe. Okay, yeah, so uh, I have another another quick question. So actually, uh, this uh, pneumatic order and the competing order physics so far is observed in the uh, twisted bilayographing, but not in other Moray systems. So uh, so is there anything in your calculation which shows that uh, the twisted bilayer is special in this sense? Um, so I don't, no. um, I don't no. really have an answer to this, but because I don't know where the Van Hoff points in these other models appear. It's certainly special for twisted bilayer graphene that you have these, um, that they, they are not exactly at the zone boundary, for example, where they would be in graphene. Uh, but I don't know what band structure calculations give for Van Hoff points in the other more heterostructures. Another thing that, that is different, or maybe not, but another thing is, of course, the valley degree of freedom, which could play a role. Here we neglected any um, valley mixing, as I said. Yeah, the uh, the special thing about twisted bilayer is it has like, relatively has more like a C6, uh, but other moraine may have C3. So so is that, is that a difference or? Um, so no, we, here we, we looked at, at a three-fold symmetric model. 
um, okay. because the C6 is, uh, it depends on the exact getting, uh, so, sorry, stacking. <laughs> um, and then we know that the, the, it's only, it's an emergent order if you don't care about the. Oh, yeah, you, you, you only, you only look at every value, right? So there's a C3 anyway in the yes. system. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, so I think we have one more question um, from Rafael Fernandez. Yeah, uh, hi, Lauren. Uh, I have a quick question. What are the symmetries broken in the S wave spin permanent field? Is it, is it only time reversal symmetry that is broken, or uh, is there something qualitatively different than just ferromagnetism? Let me put it this way. In terms of broken symmetries, of course. Um, Yes, because you have the valley degree of freedom. So, for example, it of course depends um, how they order, but you also break, for example, in this antiferromagnetic alignment, you also break the valley symmetry. And in some sense, you would even break it stronger if just one of them develops. But if I consider that I already have some valley, that if I start in a model that doesn't have U1 valley symmetry, do I break anything other than time reversal symmetry then? No. No, I don't think so. But we started, I mean, the model we started from is U1 when it's symmetric because we right. didn't include the valley mixing. Okay. And uh, if, I, if I just make just a quick comment on, on, on the discussion that you and Andre and Una were, were having about the direction of the nematic director. So regardless of the model, you always have this cubic term that forces the directors to point along the three uh, lattice directions. But... Uh, I, in the experiment by Yuan, right, one of the ideas is that because you have some underlying strain that essentially unlocks this 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 uh, uh, director. But I, I don't think there is a way out of without including external strain to make the director point in an arbitrary direction. That's just a quick comment. Right, but you are talking about pneumatic order, not the pneumatic superconducting order. So that, that can point along any direction. No, that is a six-order term that also forces that to be in some directions. Um, but anyway, we can talk more later. But uh, I, uh, there's a six-order term there. There's a cubic order here. They always fix this to be along high symmetry directions. But I think there's a confusion here about the fluctuations can be in any directions, but then the, the minima, the, the oh, right. product rate will be along one of the... Correct. Yes, that much I agree. Yes. Uh, okay, so I think we have just actually one final question from Fan Yang, and then uh, like in two minutes, I'm going to officially close the session, but we can continue talking after that. So Fan Yang, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, I have a question. I'm, um, I'm interested in your complex CDW plus SDW state. Uh, yeah, uh, you see that uh, uh, there are uh, the, the, these two these two orders, uh, density wave, uh, uh, yeah, this uh, uh, degenerate. But here we ha you have three uh, wave vectors. Uh, here uh, you analyze analysis from free energy that the three uh, three wave vectors uh, will form uh, uh, 120 degree spin arrangement. Yeah, but actually we have we have done exactly the calculation. Uh, from a uh, uh, real uh, Hamiltonian. Our result is not this uh, 120 uh, degree uh, spin arrangement. Uh, actually, our result is uh, that the three uh, uh, density wave order parameters are mutually perpendicular uh, to each other. Yeah, so uh, uh, you, here you analysis from free energy. My question is, do you have any general argument why they form such a 120 degree spin arrangement? Yeah, the reason is exactly, um, if you look at the free energy, the yeah. coupling to the charge density wave, you, you can see the details, this becomes maybe a technical discussion, but you can see the details in our archive paper. And um, we obtain, if, of course, then it depends in the free energy on the um, signs of the coupling mm -hmm. parameters. And yeah. that one we determine by integrating out the electrons and mm -hmm. the resulting sign favors exactly this configuration. 
Uh, so maybe this uh, depends on the details of the uh, Hamiltonian. I I cannot exclude that by by I would be surprised. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the, I don't think that the coupling we found was very close to um, zero. Yeah, you know, there is a famous uh, uh, model. is a single layer uh, Hamid, uh, single layer honeycomb that is near the quarter filling. In this case, there are exactly the three Q vectors. Uh, uh, so uh, in this case, uh, the the spin arrangement will just uh, uh, mix into the uh, uh, the three uh, mutually perpendicular uh, uh, spin arrangement. Yes, I know what you're referring to, but in that case, you don't have the charge density wave, and this is what gives us the coupling to the charge density wave favors exactly this arrangement. Okay, so I think uh, I'm going to just cut us off there. Thanks. Uh, so um, thanks again for a fantastic uh, session.